I'm Michelle Lowe. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs to the California Charter Schools Association. And all these folks to my left are our facilities experts in the state of California. So I'm going to pass it over to them, starting with Bill Savage, who will be mo our moderator for the day. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Bill Savage. I'm the Assistant Executive yeah, Officer for the State Allocation Board. And uh, happy to be here this afternoon to uh, assist. What have I got going here? Sorry about that. Uh, and let's start it out right now with a, uh, an update from the Office of Public School Construction, Lisa Silverman, the Acting Executive Officer. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the nice introduction. And um, I'm happy to be here. And, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. So um, you obviously do know that we, we actually um, administer, the Office of Public School Construction actually administers the school facility program on behalf of the director of DGS, the general services. And obviously, we, are, we actually are the staff and we actually serve the state allocation board as well. And again, our goal is to provide all necessary assistance to all those projects or the programs we do administer. And one of the, obviously, the key component is the, the charter school program, but embedded in that program we administer, there's a number of different um, programs we, we cover. It's new construction, modernization, um, but again, our goal is to assist the charter school community uh, through the life cycle of their project and also assist them um, with the closeout of their project expenditures and perform accounting and full reconciliation of our functions and again, support the staff and bring forward some regular regulation changes and policy changes, um, again, following the mandates that the board does provide us. And the charter school program, um, I know that we have a, a nice acronym for, their, for the charter school program, it's CSFP, and I'll, I won't confuse ourselves with all the acronyms we use in the program, but it was actually established in 2002, and again, the goal was to provide funding for, obviously, a, a good core group uh, that wasn't represented before in the past, and it's to provide funding for new construction and rehabilitation. And the charters could apply and participate in the program during specified filing rounds, and we actually had um, about $900 million authorized, as you can see. And the previous filing rounds that were awarded was back in 2003. The voters did approve over $100 million. And then back in 2005, there was $300 million authorized through Proposition 55. And in 2008, the voters did approve $500 million. So for the most part, most of those funds have been committed. And we did actually have an opportunity in the past. Um, we had some projects that didn't actually perfect. So it was about $88 million that did come back in the program. And the board actually did create a new filing round for those projects. And we did actually award um, some, some of those charter funds out to the new projects. So um, where are we at today? We actually would need a new bond at this point in time in order to provide some additional preliminary apportionments. So what's available for funding is uh, currently participating in the uh, preliminary approvals. And we actually do have a few handouts. If I can reference you to those handouts, um, we have a handout that looks like a pie chart. And our initial authorization related to Prop 47. Um, and the pie chart basically, uh, out of the 100 million that was allocated to the program, we have about 80.1 million that actually was apportioned. And, there's actually some funds that are actually waiting for conversion, so there are some commitments to that area. Um, we actually, uh, the board actually did have some opportunities to fund projects with the cash we've had via bond sales, and the board did commit to $94.2 million to advance fund those projects uh, for design and site cost. And we know, we obviously, the charter schools have a unique situation where they they're almost treated, if you're almost equivalent to the financial hardship program, they need seed money to start them moving forward. So recognizing that the seed money is, is required, the board did uh, want to obviously allocate uh, some funds to the program. And with that, um, there's actually preliminary reservations out there. And to date, we've only released about $2.8 million of that cash. And again, our goal is to ensure that the charter communities um, actually are successful in navigating through the process, and those deadlines to request those funds are actually May 2nd. So what are the requirements to access the funds? Uh, again, we need a current financial soundness determination, and that actually is done performed by a CSFA. 
and we actually need to enter charter school agreements um, before we can actually release the funds. And if you're not familiar with the fund release authorization form, it's the form 5005. Um, we also need contingent site approval letters from um, CDE for Department of Education for the site only apps. And we need a preliminary appraisal for the site applications. Uh, again, that's if you have a site application wrapped up with your project. And we need an updated application of preliminary apportionments. Um, and again, uh, the goal is to ensure that you have these components so you can access the cash. And some of the project timelines to convert to full, the full apportionments we will be reinstated after the deadline, regardless that the funds are requested. Um, so as far as the cash that we have out there, again, um, there's a 94 million that was committed to the charter school community. And if those funds aren't accessed uh, by the deadline, there obviously will be a future dialogue um, from the board's perspective on where they want to, whether keep the funds, where the charter community um, for the charter program, or where they want to move the funds over to uh, the other competing priorities in the school facilities world. <coughs> And with that, gosh, it seemed like I rolled really fast with my presentation. Um, and again, our goal is to ensure if you have any questions, uh, we have staff here that would be more than happy to walk you through the process. Um, and we would be happy to assist you. And, and please look up our website and, and look up, get some assistance from your program manager. And we'd be happy to um, help you navigate through the process. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> and I want to reiterate that uh, the entire front row is filled with staff from the Office of Public School Construction and the California Department of Education. So if you have any project needs for your charter project, I'm sorry, who? And CSFA. And CSFA. Okay, so we've got the entire multi agency review team right here for you. <laughs> Can you pass me my um, Again, I'm Bill Savage. I'm the Assistant Executive Officer for the State Allocation Board. And uh, I, don't, I want to make sure everybody knows what the State Allocation Board is. And if you're if you're new to the to the world, and the state allocation board is a a, a board uh, created under the California government code that uh, apportions all the funds for school construction, school modernization, any kind of school facilities work in California, including six legislative members, uh, the Department of Finance is the chair. There's a publicly appointed member. The Department of General Services has a member. And um, who did I leave out? Oh, in California Department of Education, uh, Ms. Moore is one of our board members. And the board meets uh, monthly and disperses funds and re uh, goes over policy issues related to school facilities in California and develops proposals for future bond funding. And really, you have a group of legislators and professionals who are extremely dedicated to school facilities. And charter school facilities have been a big part in the last decade of what the board has been all about. So I want to just uh, talk with you a little bit about the programs for charter school uh, facilities in California, where they are, uh, what's working in them, what's not working, what are some of the challenges that we face. And I, I'm new to this position. I was at a school district in the Bay Area, and we did a project there that I want to use as a case study for some of the both the pitfalls and the promises that we face as a state as we try and fund charter facilities in California. And also, I want us to look ahead because I think all of you are going to have to be at the table when the state of California begins discussing the configuration of our next bond and how that impacts or supports uh, charter facilities. So what's working is exactly what Lisa says. $900 million of state funds have been committed for charter facilities uh, over the last decade. And this is just an amazing investment, and not all of the money has come onto the street, and I'll get into some of the ins and outs of that in a second. But uh, the State Allocation Board has shown a strong commitment to charters, and one of the things that they've shown is the ability to be flexible and change timelines when they need to, to, to respect some of the unique project characteristics that charters face as they go forward. Charter projects are not the same as school district projects. You guys all know that better probably than ever, all of the people in Sacramento. And we've learned it, though, over the last decade as we begin to understand. And the best example of that is uh, the advanced site design and acquisition funding that's been made available with cash by the State Allocation Board to, uh, for projects that have preliminary apportionments and to help them start the planning 
and develop their sites. But there are some things that we have challenges, and there's some things that aren't working. Uh, and I think the number one thing that is difficult for charter facilities, uh, as just as much as it's difficult for school districts, is that uh, the state no longer sells bonds that have been authorized by the voters on an ongoing or automatic basis, so it creates a wait for cash. In other words, if you have a project, you can receive an unfunded approval and sit on a list for a year or two years or more until the state sells bonds and then has cash available and then large groups of projects get funded uh, at that time. And so we're in an era where the financial crisis has significantly impacted the state of California's ability to sell bonds on the, in the same way so that we had continuous cash available as we did back in the day, a decade ago, before even less than a decade ago before the crash. And so this particularly impacts charters who are then potentially have to sit on a list and uh, they might have gotten their site acquisition cash they might have done their advanced planning, but if they need the full funding to go forward from the state for that project, then they're unable to, they, they can't do anything. They're dead in the water. Or now, some, some charters we, we know, as, as districts do, do bridge financing, and there's options there. But this is the, just the overall financial crisis, where we find ourselves in California in relation to the wall of debt that we face and the difficulty of selling bonds and raising cash has impacted the charter program and all school district programs in the state of California. Um, you know, I talked about the site cash and the advanced design cash funding being available, but um, I'll tell you right now, we're, the people are not coming forward with projects at a very rapid rate. There's actual cash that's been reserved by the state allocation board to fund advance apportionments for charters, but we're not seeing charters coming in to get the money. So that's part of the dialogue that we want to have today with uh, CSFA and all of us on the panel here. And we talked about a lot of these issues uh, when we look at these things. First of all, um, is uh, financial soundness review requirements, how do they dovetail with their six month timeline how do they dovetail with the funding cycle so that uh, charter projects have everything synced up and ready to go? And we can talk about that further. Another item is uh, the facilities use agreements and all of the agreements that are required to be executed prior to receiving funding. These are, um, and I, I'm going to step back and speak as someone who was in a school district and then had to work with the charter to negotiate an agreement. And I can tell you it was extremely difficult. And the charter member is here too, and she can, she can share that. It was, it, it's just a time consuming project process. But when you have to have a facilities use agreement for a project, you need to, let's say you're getting an advance apportionment for designer site. You have to have all your agreements in place for something that may not be built or even exist for four years or five, you know, X number of years. It's hard to get people to focus on that sometimes in a school district or in the setting of our ongoing lives to focus on those. So we want to talk about some of the ways that we can uh, work on the use agreement requirements and keep streamlining those. And I know CSFA has done some great stuff with streamlining them already. Some of the opportunities that we face as a state are that there is cash, that the board has reserved cash to fund charter facilities, and it's been designated just for charters. So, but, uh, but stepping back from that, <clears throat> charters and districts, after the preliminary apportionment phase, are competing for any available cash for projects that come through to convert. So if a, if a charter project is perfected and gets an unfunded approval and goes on the unfunded approval list, there is no priority for a charter project. A charter project is in line with 300 other school district projects. And the date order is what is the ranking principle, and that has not been changed. And so uh, one of the things that we all need to talk about is, is that going to work? What challenges does it create? What opportunities do we have to 
uh, find a way to make that work. One of the big opportunities that's coming up and we see on the horizon is that there will be projects in the pipeline for charters that don't convert preliminary apportionments into final projects, so funds will revert back. So presumably those reserved funds could become available, but the board will need to hear from everyone and understand what the need is and could consider a new filing round for charters based on the projects that don't convert and funds that may come back. Um, I want to take a second to talk with you uh, about a project that I worked on at the West Contra Costa Unified School District in uh, partnership with Leadership Public Schools. And uh, Susie Park, the Director of Operations, is here from Leadership Public Schools. This was a charter high school uh, located on a shared site with a district continuation high. And the, the project really represents an, a, a, a great commitment and a great partnership between the district and the charter school. And one of the ways that it was really uh, came to fruition is that the charter community mobilized to pass the local general obligation bond that would fund that charter school. And by doing that, by bringing their, they had their staff and teachers and kids and families out, you know, doing phone banking, walking the streets, participating in all the local fundraising bond efforts that school districts go to, and it really cemented the partnership in an amazing way, and the, and the charter projects were then given priority on the bond funding master list, master plan list, that the district developed. Uh, the, dis the project received its uh, initial funding under Prop 1D in the 2008 round. It was uh, the highest ranked project in the state of California. And the reason it was the highest ranked is because under Prop 1D, there was a new category of facilities, projects, and priority points given for projects that rehabilitate underutilized district facilities, which was the case in this particular school, and which we eventually ended up demolishing. Uh, but a uh, you know, like-in-kind replacement, it's called under the state program. So we, the district received $12.4 million in state funding under Prop 1D and a $3 million loan from CSFA. Uh, and we also received, eventually, uh, we were able to work with CSFA and the district, on behalf of the charter, received a qualified school construction bond allocation of $20 million dollars to assist in the overall project scope of work, in funding the overall project. But to, to those are some of the great you know, background of the project, but the pitfalls are it's four years since we received funding and we still don't have DSA approval, Division of State Architect approval, to go out to bid, to come back and actually get the money. Okay, so we can't get the money as charters or districts without DSA approval, CDE approval, all of the approvals going forward, and it's taken four years of planning and design and approval to get that project to the state where it's just about to be approved by the state of California DSA. So we were also unable to access the pre-designed funds, the 20, up to 20%, is it 20% or 25%? 20% of your, of your overall apportionment you can receive in advance funding. We were unable to do that because we couldn't get the use agreements executed in time to meet the funding cycle. Uh, so again, some of the issues that we face. The district also, my final um, piece here on this one, the district initially applied for state funding on behalf of the charter but when we also received a CSFA loan clearly identified for charter schools, when we went to apply to OPSC for our advanced funding, we were basically informed that we had to change the application so the charter was applying on behalf of the, of the project rather than the district because there was a loan involved and clearly the loans are for charter schools and not for school districts. So just some of the pieces about you know, going through the process but I think uh, uh, this is a successful project and we think it's going to be starting construction later this year. Um, finally, uh, just to finish up, I do want to say that we face some challenging times and we're looking forward to discussing a new state bond in California to fund school facilities. 
Uh, charters have continued to grow in importance as school facilities in California, and they'll clearly be part of any facilities bond that we have as we go forward as a state. But I think charters need to be very, very careful to make sure you're at the table and, and that your uh, facilities needs are made clear to the board and the legislature and the governor. Just as an example, one of the things that is talked about, a lot of things get talked about in Sacramento, one of the things that's talked about as a, as a new bond configuration is a not to have any more boutique programs, boutique programs like seismic, high performance, maybe charters. I don't know. I'm just saying. If you, if, and so the notion there is you just create a large pot of money and any, everybody just goes after it, right? But this could disadvantage certain groups. And so you need to make sure that you're at the table and that your legislative team is there. And as we go forward, there's going to be uh, lengthy discussions over the next year and a half about the shape of, a, of the next school facilities bond in the state, and I appreciate your attention. So I'm going to pass this on to uh, Katrina Johansson. Right? Wait. No. Nope, CDE, I'm sorry. Kathleen Moore. Yay. Sorry. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Moore, and I'm director of the School Facilities and Transportation Services Division. Of the Cal at the California Department of Education. And we also have a role in the um, charter school facility program. So you kind of get a flavor for the many, um, the two boards that are involved, the state allocation board that um, Bill Savage talked about, and the school, um, California School Finance Authority Board, which Katrina will talk about after me, are the two boards of authority around this program. And then there are really four um, also key state agencies. You heard from um, Lisa Silverman of the Office of Public School Construction. There's our department um, at the Department of Education. There's also the Department of Toxic Substance Control, which comes into play um, on this program, and the Division of State Architect, which, um, which Bill mentioned. So we fall within one of the agencies that is part of the program and one of the agencies in which charter schools along with all other schools have to receive approvals for their projects. Our, our role is on, at the Department of Education in this program, is on um, site selection, um, site approvals, and plan approvals. So we're looking at the sites as we look at all school sites in California for their um, for their safety and health considerations um, and then we look at the plans for educational appropriateness and those are our, our, our main role um, in the system and as Lisa indicated um, you have to have our approval as well as the Division of State Architect approval um, for that final um, construction um, for the, the way to get to the, to the funding. Um, and these are our authorities. Um, first, that we uh, were part of the charter school application program. We established the standards for site and design, and those are in our Title V regulations. Um, is what we're reviewing the plans towards. So what happens when a project comes to the Department of Education? And I think as Lisa Silverman also indicated, our role we see is both, um, is both regulatory and best practice. And we do have a regulatory side, um, but moreover, we're just wanting to ensure that your project can make it through and be approvable um, for, the, for the funding component. And the earlier that you are in talking to um, the department, the better. We have, um, typically, we organize our projects um, geographically, um, and they, I have uh, consultants in the geographic area. However, for charters, we decided to simply have one person, one point person at the office so that um, she could know the issues more intimately and that she could work um, very closely with that. And it's Lisa Olakoya in our office. Lisa, could you just stand up? So this is really the key person um, in our offices, thank you, Lisa, that um, around charter schools that you want to get to early on um, in the system. And what we do is we have to look at the initial site um, to ensure that it meets just baseline um, 
baseline safety issues, and then as you move through the more formal due diligence process that we can approve the site um, for acquisition. And again, um, it, the key to that is contacting Lisa early on. After the, after the site um, component is complete, or even sometimes tangentially, we're looking at the design plans. And what we ask, as in all schools, that there is an educational specification done for the design plans, which means that you actually know that, that there's the program aspect and how that would impact a building design um, is what we ask that, that the charters as well as um, regular uh, education schools um, develop. And then from that, the design drawings are, are determined. And we have two points that we look at the design drawings at the beginning. Um, when they're in schematic, um, when they're more uh, uh, malleable, I say, and really then at when they're going into the Division of State Architect and they're actually becoming much harder, um, hard documents. And again, it's really key to have the early documents in so that if there's any problems or issues that we can elevate them and that they can be worked out with the, with the owner, the charter school, um, the architect, and, and our office. Um, Mainly kinds of issues that we're oftentimes looking at are safety issues for students, um, and that's, that will be key in our review. And as I said, um, we have a number of resources around that, the most important of which is Lisa. The department also has the charter schools division that operates a, the, what's called, I'm sure all of you are familiar with in the charter world, the SB 740. Um, program and I know um, Julie Feltzar is here. The director of that pro uh, director of that program is here, and after this session, they are also doing um, a, a more in-depth um, uh, presentation with all of the CD programs that they operate um, as well. And that's some that is a separate program to the one that we're talking about that everyone is involved with um, on on this on the podium today. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it over to Katrina for her portion. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And um, please sit tight because I'm going to talk about CSFP, which there isn't any capacity in that program, but I'm also going to talk about other programs where there is some capacity. We have available funding through some other programs. And all the things we're talking about today are really good lessons uh, as you work with a lender and construct a facility. So. Um, and if there is another statewide ballot measure, you'll be ready to apply for CSFP. So um, can I see a show of hands of folks that do have a CSFP award? I know Susie's here, Bert Corona, Anna Ponce. Okay, so um, I just want to know our audience. And then we also administer the uh, State Charter School Facility Incentive Grants Program. We uh, are responsible for allocating the state's federal um, QSCBs, which are the Qualified School Construction Bonds. And uh, we also have a new credit enhancement grant as well as conduit issuance authority. So um, I am with the California School Finance Authority. We are a state agency. Uh, we have a three-member board. The state treasurer, Bill Lockyer, serves as the chair of the, state, uh, of the CSFA board. Um, CDE is another member of our board, uh, as well as the um, director of finance. Uh, we do have monthly meetings in Sacramento. We have offices in Los Angeles. The authority has been around since the mid-'80s, and we have uh, our function was to provide financing for school districts, community college districts, and county offices of education. Um, but at this point in time, districts and county offices of ed are out issuing their own bonds um, and don't really need a conduit issuer. So in 2002, CSFA was written into the Charter School Facility Program to serve as um, the underwriter, if you will, on behalf of the state. And our job is to determine which schools are credit worthy to pay the state back. Because the $900 million is a revolving fund, so that $450 million goes out as a grant, and then $450 million, approximately, because some schools have provided a lump sum, comes back to the state in the form of payments over a 30-year period. So our analysis is really a pass-fail analysis. We don't give you a AAA rating or a you know, triple B minus rating. We just say, can you pay the state back or not? And those of you who have been through our process know that um, we try and make it relatively easy, but again, we are lenders serving on behalf of the state. These are public funds, so I know some people have, you know, it's, I, it's a learning process for all of us. But um, So primarily we look at, as the law says, the ability to maintain, maintain stable financial operations and make your estimated CSFP payments. 
The assumptions that we use are a 30-year loan. Um, the rate that we use is currently 2%. We have a lesser of the two um, calculation. We look at um, the most recent uh, rate on the pooled money investment <coughs> fund, which right now is, I think, 0.5%, which we're not going to give away 0.5% money. Um, and then we look at 50% of the state's most recent geo bond sale, and whichever is uh, less, we use that, but nothing less than 2%, because we are we charge the program 2% in admin fees, so that was the rationale for the 2%, and that is written into law. Um, payments commence one full year after occupying the facility. We realize that you're probably going to grow in enrollment, and to realize that additional ADA, we start payments a year after um, you're in that facility for a year. And now we have a new policy where your payments under this program are intercepted at the state level. You kind of have a lien on your paycheck. You don't get we don't you don't get that money. It goes from the from the um, CDE to uh, to the state board state allocation board, and those payments are made on behalf of the charter. That was just implemented this summer, and so we're working with schools right now to coordinate that with the controller's office. Um, you know, obviously, we're going to look at how reasonable are your projections. Um, we look at waiting lists. Um, we look at enrollment rates, retention rates. Um, we look at past, current, and future financial performance. Um, we, we upload all of this information into a financial model that you know, spits out a number of indicators, and we bring a staff report to our board and make a recommendation to our board. Um, we look really closely at your reliance on contributions and subsidies from parent organizations and guarantors. This has become less of an issue as we've adopted this policy to intercept payments. Um, we kind of mitigated that risk on behalf of the state. And we also look at the effects of state and local financials on operations and projections, like any lender would. And then some of the more uh, qualitative or operational factors that we look at and bring to our board are um, compliance with the charter terms and standing with your authorizer. This is uh, an eligibility criteria for all the programs that we administer. Um, we look at if your charter is about to expire, we look at the likelihood of charter renewal. Uh, we are in communication with charter authorizers. Um, regarding these issues. Again, we look at enrollment and retention trends and projections. Uh, we look carefully at student performance trends. We look at the expertise of management and personnel. Uh, we look at the board composition and governance structure, and then any unresolved legal issues. We do have a legal status questionnaire, and we have to vet those through our uh, legal counsel in the event that we vet those in the event that the school might have a financial um, liability as a result of those legal issues. Um, Bill mentioned some of the current challenges that we're facing with the program, and these are some of the things that um, the CSFA board has been engaged in. Um, all schools are now subject to the intercept mechanism to repay their CSFP payments. Um, there are a few exceptions for schools that are already making their payments, um, but those schools are grandfathered in, but from this point forward, all um, payments are going to be made using the intercept. Um, the board is looking closely at how much we rely on AYP, given that the um, percentage proficient keeps going up. Um, we noticed that trend where fewer and fewer schools were meeting all those criteria. So we, we uh, notified the board of this trend. And um, clearly, we're uh, cognizant of the state deferrals, um, the proposed triggers, and the reduction in state aid. Um, but when we're looking at our projections and when you're, you're fully um, occupying your new facility, um, we are those are, that's so many years out that we are allowing some growth assumptions in those out years, but for current years and years one and two, we are looking at zero percent and even doing some stress testing at you know negative three or negative four percent on that state aid as we run our projections. And then the program agreements, we know um, these are legal agreements. They are cumbersome. Um, there are a lot of legalese. We would love for them to all be uniform, but we have about eight different fact patterns in this program where you have a charter and the state only. You've got a charter that doesn't need a loan only. You've got a charter, a district, another governmental entity, and the state. So we have about eight different fact patterns, and we've developed a template for each of these program agreements. So our, our new position um, as the keeper of these program agreements is to send out a very standard agreement, and charters you know, can review them with their legal counsel, but there's not going to be a whole lot of back and forth in terms of the provisions in those agreements because um, we are trying to streamline this process and get money out quicker. And then um, the timing of financial soundness, as Bill mentioned, uh, the board has adopted a policy that six months is 
you know, a good period of time for the review of financial soundness to be in place. Um, that determination is always uh, subject to any material changes at the school in terms of operations or finances. Um, so our board has made a decision that six months is, you know, a good time period. If you're just outside of six months and you want to come in um, to be found financially sound, we do a very cursory review of any updated information since the last time we did a review. And let's see. Now I'm going to talk about any questions on CSFP and financial soundness at this time? Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about the federally funded state charter school facility incentive grants program. I'd rather say it than uh, remember the initials for that one. Uh, so this is a federally funded program. In 2004, we wrote the application um, for a federal award. And at the time, we were, uh, when we applied for this funding, we said we were gonna dump the 50 million into CSFP. So instead of it being a $400 million program, it's gonna be a $450 million program. So we wrote the application, we got the award, and then everyone said, that's a terrible idea. Why would you put 50 million more into CSFP? Why don't you create something that's more flexible? So we asked for a waiver and a modification from the feds, and we came up with something similar to SB 740. Ours is an annual program for facility costs. Um, we do provide for ongoing annual costs for um, three years, but we also allow for uh, funding for facility acquisition, renovation, and construction. Um, I don't know how much detail is on these slides, so well, let's see. Okay, um, so for the ongoing lease and facility costs, the maximum award is $750, I'm sorry, $750 per ADA um, or 75% uh, of your facility costs, whichever is less. And for construction, it's 1,000 per ADA, um, up to 500,000 per year or 1.5 million. So this program has really made a difference for schools that have, uh, if the timing is just right, to acquire a facility or make some serious renovations to a facility. So um, several schools have maxed out their award and done some great things with this program. Um, it's not a field act program, but you, you know, there are local permitting um, issues that uh, you have to comply with. As well, it's, uh, you have to comply with the Davis-Bacon, which are prevailing wage when you're paying folks. So we encourage folks to buy things with this grant rather than pay laborers, but obviously a lot of folks do submit um, invoices, but it, that, that type of project is very labor intensive. So the timing on that, you know, we've, we've heard some folks that, you know, they've been frustrated on, oh, why do you need so much documentation? This is a federal grant. We've been audited. Um, we, you know, thank God we have all the paper we do have. So, um, you know, it is a, a very competitive program. Out of 160 plus applications in round seven, we funded about 22 schools. So we, we don't prorate the pot of money. Um, we rank the charters by preference points. Um, we have a 160 point scale. Um, we have made a few changes. I, I think most of you probably got an email from us last week, last Thursday, about the start of round eight. So we have round eight, round nine, and round 10 left. Um, since 2006, the program has provided 64 million in funds to 200 public charter schools serving 68,000 students. Um, this is a site-based uh, program for site-based schools as well as CSFP. Stephen, did, anything to add on that? Kind of rush through it. 150, thank you. Um, the next program I'm gonna talk about is a $8.3 million award from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, this, this is strictly to enhance uh, a financing for charter schools. So um, we are currently in the process of our regs becoming effective. They're at OAL right now. The board has adopted the proposed regulations that we put forth. We worked with the association who currently has a grant and other stakeholders to try and craft something that um, was uh, flexible, yet we do have a statute that we that, that drives how we run our programs as well as our um, performance agreement with the feds. So what we came up with was um, a maximum award of 1.5 million per application. So this award would be would set be set aside in the event there was um, any delinquencies in payment. It would just bolster the credit of a financing for a charter school facility. It's not for working capital, but it's only for facilities. Um, we will be making awards as well as serving as a conduit issuer on privately placed or, or publicly offered debt. 
Um, so that would be a loan with a, with a CDFI or a lender or a, you know, a, a structured financing that we would go out to the capital markets and sell. Um, the grant is targeted to schools serving low-income students, so we have developed a threshold of 50% of your students have to be eligible for free and reduced price meal program. And if the program is oversubscribed, the following evaluation criteria will be applied. Um, Low-income data, student performance, and creditworthiness of the financing. Okay, QSCBs. Again, this is a fender, uh, federal fund, federally funded program. It's not really um, their subsidies that are bring down your net interest cost, your annual interest cost. Um, so the net sinking fund payments um, are very attractive if you can access this funding. Um, we have, uh, out of the $141 million that we had um, to allocate, um, the authority actually ended up only issuing approximately $30 million, um, $40 million. Um, the other authority was transported to another issuer, and those, in those, all those cases they were districts. Uh, I'm sorry, there was one that was issued by another issuer. Um, so we only have about $22 million left to allocate of this QSEB authority. Um, and that is, uh, we already have an application in-house. Um, we've never been in a position to be oversubscribed to this program um, because we have had an over-the-counter uh, application type process. Um, and uh, for the most part, most of the allocations have actually uh, have converted to an actual financing and been issued and those projects are being constructed and up and running. So this has been a successful program, but we understand through our colleagues in Washington that um, there aren't going to be additional QSCB um, allocations, you know, in, you know, in the federal budget. They're looking at Build America bonds, but, um, you know, a similar program, but um, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that as it relates to charters. Um, and then our conduit issuance authority, um, as I mentioned, CSFA is a conduit issuer, which means that on behalf of a borrower, a tax-exempt uh, charter school, uh, I'm sorry, a nonprofit charter school, the authority would actually structure financing and go to market on behalf of a borrower. Um, we have lots and lots of capacity as a conduit issuer. So it's not a pot of money sitting there, but we have $4 billion, I believe, in bonding authority available. Um, and we, the typical deals that we've done as a conduit issuer, um, we help a uh, financing team structure a financing and then we go to the capital markets. Um, primarily, I think the, some of the features that make the authority um, an attractive issuer, um, one is the intercept mechanism. Um, we can intercept a portion of your state aid to, to, to go directly to the trustee and pay off the um, investor. Um, so that is an attractive credit feature. Um, we are currently working on a financing where there will be um, an intrinsic rating done on a financing. We haven't done a, a deal. The deals we've done as a conduit issuer have been either so credit enhanced that they've been a AAA rated deal or they have been non-rated and privately placed, which I think charters are typically um, used to. Um, so we are working on a deal right now where we might actually see the value of the intercept in a credit rating. We do have monthly board meetings. We can have them more frequently um, if we need to. Um, we do have the ability to issue what's called uh, a TEFRA, um, which is the Tax Equity Fairness and Responsibility Act. You basically need to tell the public that this tax, ex uh, this nonprofit entity or this entity is um, having tax exempt bonds issued on their behalf. So, um, and then folks can show up and say, you know, if they want to, this doesn't seem fair, but um, the TEFRA hearings that we've held, I don't I think there were um, very few people came to the meeting. Um, we do have very low issuance fees as well as annual admin fees. Uh, we are a governmental entity. We're mission driven, not transaction driven. Um, and we, um, the State Treasurer's Office Public Finance Division statutorily serves as agent for sale in our financings, which means the folks that are structuring and issuing the state's billions of dollars in debt are also supporting the authority, look at comparables in terms of interest rates as well as cost of issuance. So they are kind of our partners in these financings. Um, the Attorney General serves as our issuer's counsel in all our transactions, and um, our three-member board has uh, lots of charter lending experience, and all financings are publicly vetted for approval. So this is a good and a bad thing, um, but there's a lot of financial information that's disclosed, and because we're a public entity, you know, they are subject to 
being available publicly. So um, this is something that we've had conduit issuance authority for charters since January 2007. Um, so that was relatively new. We um, did have the, the term charter school added to our statute so that we could issue debt on behalf of charters.